This is From Religion to Political Power, a podcast on the intersection of religion, politics, and power. I'm Dr. Andre Gagne, full professor in the Department of Theological Studies at Concordia University in Montreal. Hello, this is the first episode from Religion to Political Power, first episode of this new podcast. Uh, I wanted to do this. I have a lot to say. (laughs) It's not always easy to say everything we want to say in publications. Uh, Sometimes we're limited. But maybe with a podcast, uh, we can accomplish a little more. Now, I don't want to make those podcast episodes too long. I know that uh, people are extremely busy, but I want to give enough uh, content so that we can better understand uh, religion, its interaction with politics and power. Now, as you know, I am a professor in the Department of Theological Studies at Concordia University. My main areas of specialization are uh, neo-charismatic Pentecostalism, evangelicalism, the Christian right, uh, the relationship between religion and uh, violence, and also political theology. So I'm very much interested in that interaction between uh, Christianity and politics, uh, especially uh, in the context of American politics, but also across the globe. So in this podcast, we'll try to look at different things, uh, not only in America, but also maybe even here in Canada, but elsewhere across the globe, and how religion, especially Christianity, and some forms of Christianity, uh, Christianities, we can even say Christianities maybe, uh, become politicized and uh, have sometimes an important role in uh, politics. So Thinking about religion, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are of interest. Uh, As I mentioned, Christianity in general, evangelicalism itself, uh, all the subcategories, sub-branches of evangelicalism. But I want to focus a lot on the less well-known segments of evangelicalism. For example, Pentecostalism. Uh, We have what often is characterized as the first wave, which is this Pentecostal movement, at least in America. It starts at the early uh, early uh, 20th century, end of, also end of the 19th century. Uh, you have people like Charles Parham, uh, William Seymour. So we're going to talk about that history, how it's rooted in, of course, the Methodist holiness uh, tradition, want to talk about these things because we see a lot of things related to Pentecostalism slash charismatics or neo-charismatics today, especially around issues of spiritual gifts, spiritual warfare, things like that. And sometimes we have the impression that this is really new, especially if we're not part of a Pentecostal church or a charismatic church. So we think this is new or this is strange because, you know, we're not used to this. But in fact, a lot of the things that we see are not necessarily new, but they are used differently. And and what we see today is the politicization of these concepts, of these ideas. And that's what we're going to look at. So focusing on understudied groups like Pentecostal groups, their various cultures, their beliefs, their practices, also charismatics that came up in uh, the 60s and 70s. Uh, where the Pentecostal experience, you know, this, this idea of uh, experiencing the Holy Spirit, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we can call it like that, uh, the empowering of the Spirit, uh, now extended itself to groups that were mainline groups, uh, uh, mainline denominations, Roman Catholics, Episcopal, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Anglicans, and so on. So they had the Pentecostal experience. They didn't necessarily explain or adopt, for example, the Pentecostal ex- explanation of speaking in tongues as the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But we'll, we'll talk about these differences. And later on in the 80s, 
but also starting in the 70s, it's really kind of emerging out of the charismatic movement, what will become ne the neo-charismatic movement, or sometime uh, what we call the third wave. Uh, this is a term, as you know, that was coined by uh, C. Peter Wagner, but it's out of uh, this, this moment in the 70s and, and 80s with John Wimber's uh, Vineyard Church, uh, ideas around power evangelism, uh, his ideas of inaugurated eschatology, all of that. Uh, we're going to talk about that because I think it's important what we're seeing today to understand the history of this. Uh, we talk a lot about the NAR, eh, the New Apostolic Reformation, and with reason, you know, because it has a an important role today in Christianity, in American uh, uh, Christianity, but elsewhere in the world. It has a, an, inter an international dimension to it. But it also has a history, right? and it's rooted in things that came before. So it's important to understand this, 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 this Pentecostal wave, charismatic wave, um, and how we see it today enacted in society and in politics. So we're going to look at the neo-charismatics, and out of this came, of course, the NAR. But also ideas. This is very important in terms of ideas. Uh, things like dominion theology uh, or dominionism. A lot of people talk about that, but what is that exactly? And are, is, is there more than one dominion, <laughs> dominionism? Eh? Could, you, could, could we talk about dominionisms, plural? We'll see that there are various streams of dominionism, and they all have a, a particular history. Uh, often we, we associate dominionism with Christian reconstructionism, and, and that's fine. Uh, uh, you know, Rushduni, uh, that was an idea of, of his, of course, uh, part of, of one of his ideas. But also dominionism uh, was Pentecostalized, in a sense, uh, at one point. And we see this idea emerge through a stream in the 80s called Kingdom Now, Bishop Earl Polk, that popularized this idea, which is essentially uh, dominionism, but with a charismatic twist to it, a very Pentecostal twist to it. Now, of course, uh, Polk himself, will see this, was very, very much influenced by a group um, that is called the New Order of the Latter Rain in 1948, uh, a group that's actually started in Canada, in Saskatchewan in 1948, and, and, and from that, a lot of the ideas that emerged from that group ended up influencing charismatics and neo-charismatics, and we can see and recognize some of these ideas even now in the New Apostolic Reformation. We'll talk about that. So dominionism is very important. Ideas around prosperity gospel, what is that? Is it close to... Uh, Pentecostals or Charismatics? Is there an association with, with New Apostolic Reformation ideas? Um, spiritual warfare? Uh, we <laughs> hear about spiritual warfare a lot. The mainstream media has picked up on that, which is important, I think, because a lot of these ideas go beyond the spiritual dimension of warfare. Sometimes they, they, we, we sense that they're there is, a, there is a kind of blending into the physical world that they, these ideas might be enacted uh, physically. So it's important to understand where this comes from uh, up to a certain extent. What is the history behind a spiritual, uh, spiritual warfare? Everything related also, I think it's important, and this is something that I want to address in uh, this uh, podcast, uh, spiritual gifts. Uh, this is something that... Uh, we find out of the uh, Pentecostal tradition, uh, spiritual gifts, uh, and, uh, and also, also the offices, the ministry offices, or what we call the fivefold ministry. We'll talk about that. Uh, where the, do these ideas come from? Are there different ways of conceptualizing the idea of spiritual gifts, these, this uh, empowerment by the Spirit that the Holy Spirit gives Christians certain gifts? Uh, some are situational, according to some definitions. Some are situational. Others are, uh, are constitutional. We'll talk about that. What does that actually mean? Uh, uh, so spiritual gifts, we think of uh, speaking in tongues, healing, 
prophecy, and so on. So there are lists in the New Testament of spiritual gifts. And there are people today that actually believe that God still empowers Christians to manifest those gifts for the building up of the church. So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about in this podcast, one of the things that I think we really need to impact, and there's a lot of confusion about this, is eschatology. Uh, the, the, the teachings about the end times. There are various ways of understanding the end times. There's various eschatological systems. And this can be very complicated. It's not always about the rapture. It's not always about, uh, you know, the kingdom of God here on earth now. Um, so we have to classify these ideas. How do people read for example, the book of Revelation in the New Testament. How do they in interpret that? And the way they interpret that will often influence their eschatology. How do, it, th th how do they interpret, for example, passages in the Gospels? Uh, there is an eschatological discourse of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13, Luke chapter 21. How do people read that? Are they are 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 is are these discourses of Jesus at the time futuristic in perspective, or have they been accomplished already? So this affects also how one understands things like the rapture, uh, the end times, the tribulation period, the millennium, and so on. So we'll we'll kind of unpack that. I also want to take some time to really go through. Um, you know, his, the history of, of uh, charismaticism itself uh, or, or Pentecostalism or what led to Pentecostalism. So we're going to look at American revivalism. Uh, we're going to, uh, sometimes we, we might have an episode or two on the Great Awakenings uh, with people like Wesley Whitfield and Finney, uh, Charles Finney. Um, or, or uh, Jonathan Edwards. Eh? So these people were very, very much uh, at the root of American revivalism, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, talking about, like I said, the Methodist Holiness Movement, uh, uh, talking about uh, people like Parham, Seymour, attached to American uh, Pentecostalism, uh, neo-evangelicals with the rise of Billy Graham, in at the end of the uh, uh, around the the nineteen fifties, uh, early nineteen fifties, uh, talk about uh, healing revivalists at the time: Oral Roberts, uh, William Brenham, A. A. Allen, Jack Coe, and others. Uh, these are important players that set the stage to what will become uh, neo charismaticism and how neo charismaticism absorbs all of these ideas, and especially the healing revivalists. So we're going to talk about that. I want to take some time also probably to unpack the Jesus movement with, um, uh, in, 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 the, in the 1960s. Uh, this, this is going to be extremely important with Lonnie Frisbee. Uh, we're going to try to take some time also to talk about another segment in the, in the 1980s, the Kansas City Prophets how that triggered the prophetic movement. Uh, so uh, key players of the Kansas City prophet at that time, uh, prophets at that time, uh, you have Mike Beckel and Bob Jones and Paul Kane and others, but you also have prophets around at that time, people like Bill Hammond. So that's going to be important because Bill Hammond really, really shapes the way people are going to think about the prophetic. He's going to out. He's really going to lay out his understanding of restorationism, how in the end times, according to him, and he inherits this a bit from the New Order of the Latter Rain. He he was in connection with people that were tied to this revival. Um, so what happens with Hammond is he's going to lay out uh, a history of the unfolding of the restoration of the fivefold ministry. And that's going to influence a lot of people. It's going to influence, of course, Earl Polk in the, in the 1980s, but it's also going to very much influence uh, C. Peter Wagner and his conception of the New Apostolic Reformation and the restoration 
of modern day apostles. So we're going to talk about that, talk about things like uh, the various revivals that emerged out of the Toronto Blaise Blessing in 19, uh, 1994, uh, you know, the Lake, uh, Lakeside Revival, uh, Pensacola Revival, and, and, and various other revivals. And, and the key players that were there up till today with the NAR and everything that, that revolves around the NAR with apostolic governance and so on. So we have a lot of things, <laughs> a lot of stuff to, to cover. Uh, I want to take more time to go in depth, talk about key players, um, because we don't always have time to do that. Even in interviews, I've given a lot of interviews on these topics and, and re re related questions. And of course, we're limited in time. So now with uh, my own podcast, I will have time to spend on several episodes to really, really unpack a lot of these ideas and maybe recommend readings, uh, talking about various things. Another very interesting thing uh, that, I, that I will be working on personally is everything related to uh, the emergence of healing. Uh, uh, that too. Uh, and there's a lot of literature around that. So we're going to talk about various healing revivalists uh, and, and how that, that started. So I hope you're going to stick around. I hope you're going to find this podcast interesting. This is really a, a mixture of religion, politics, and power. You see, when the power is not just political power. It's also spiritual power. It's how some of these groups understand themselves as being empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the things that they deem Jesus called them to do. So we're going to stop here for today. We've covered a lot of ground. I hope this is not too much of a... Uh, you know, complicated thing that I've just exposed to you or, or presented to you. It's not too overwhelming. We're going to talk about this uh, progressively, but I just wanted to lay out some of the interesting themes that I think we need to discuss uh, and unpack a little more, go a little more in depth um, so that we can have a better understanding, a better grasp of these groups and how they operate still today. Uh, in order to have, you know, something to say when we need to uh, explain to uh, individuals or even ourselves, when we see things, when we hear the rhetoric, when we see th how they, 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 beha they behave, some of these groups, how they become politicized, we can understand why and where it comes from. So we'll stop here, and I hope you'll join me in the next few weeks again for uh, subsequent episodes of this new podcast called From Religion to Political Power. Thank you for listening from Religion to Political Power, a podcast on the intersection of religion, politics, and power. You can subscribe to this podcast on the From Religion to Political Power Substack page, where you will also find additional resources and podcast episodes. If interested, you can also follow me, Andre Gagne, on Twitter, Mastodon, YouTube, and on my faculty page at Concordia University. The intro and outro music of this podcast is from Yanni's 1994 album, Live at the Acropolis. Kindly consider sharing this podcast with people in your network and stay tuned for more episodes from religion to political power.